here, all right, and those in the sanctuary as well as those watching us online, it's great to be able to worship together, amen? amen? For the past two months, we've been looking at the book of Job, and we've been considering the book of Job as a series of nine acts performed out on the stage of life. Now, each act has shown us more and more of what Job went through and also gives us guidance so that we might truly know how to navigate our lives during difficult times. Job has been sitting for months on an ash heap, suffering intense pain from a life-threatening illness and disease that was ravaging his body, and also suffering emotional ag anguish over the death of his children, his loss of his wife, and the loss of his possessions. We have also seen for several weeks uh, and listened to Job's four friends who have come from different surrounding countries supposedly to sympathize and to comfort Job to give a series of well-rehearsed speeches. Um, these speeches, though, accused Job as being a hypocrite, and they insisted upon the fact that God was punishing Job for actively being engaged in sinful behavior. I'm a little hot in here as far as the microphone. If you can. Job responded to each of these speeches trying to present a proper apologetic to his theologically messed up friends. And then finally, as we saw last week, the Lord took center stage and showed Job that he had limited understanding of the ways of God and that he lacked strength to fight the enemy that was threatening his life. So, with a broken and contrite heart, Job repents to the Lord. Today we come to the last act in the book of Job. Welcome to Act 9, where we see the drama of redemption. Today we will see the Lord restoring Job's health his possessions, as well as his family. But before we look at today's text, I want to remind you of how we concluded last week in that this wonderful restoration began when Job repented at the altar on the ash heap. The place where Job had sat in misery for months became the place of worship and adoration to God. The place of Job's calamity became his church. And what made the difference? God showed up. No longer was Job's losses the center of his life. No longer was his disease the center of his life. No longer were his distracting friends the center of his life. No, the Lord showed up and took center stage in Job's life. Amen? And brothers and sisters, the Lord is here today to take center stage of your life. We cannot expect the Lord to bring restoration if we continue to allow other things to be the center of our lives. We cannot allow a pandemic, the loss of a job, the uncertainty of a future to be the center of our lives. The Lord and his glory must be the center of our lives. Amen? Amen? And if we humble ourselves and crown the Lord at the center of our lives, well, we will experience the Lord's restoration in every dimension in our life as what we will see in jo that Job experienced. So what I'm saying is that the Lord will bring to us the same restoration that he brought Job. Maybe not precisely in the same form, but with the same spirit and the same design. And how can I say that? Because we have the same God. Amen. The God who works wonders. The one who made his strength known to Job. Well, this same God will work wonders and make his strength known to us. Amen? Amen. So after... Job humbled himself on the ash heap and, re and repented to the Lord, making the Lord the center of his life. 
The scripture picks up in Job chapter 42 and verse 7. Hear now the word of God. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as what he had before. All of his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and about 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The name of the first daughter he named Jemima, and the name of the second was Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapak. Now, nowhere in the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and they, their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so Job died an old man, and full of years. That, bless, that completes the reading of God's holy and inspired word. So notice again that directly after Job humbles himself on the ash heap and repented in dust and ash, ashes, that the Lord speaks to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now, the Lord addresses Eliphaz because he's probably the oldest, and we know that Eliphaz was the one who spoke the first speak, speech. But what the Lord says to Eliphaz is a rebuke to all the other friends as well. And what was the Lord's message? Well, to state it mildly, he wasn't happy with Job's friends. The translations range from everywhere where the Lord's saying, I am angry with you to my anger burns against you, to my wrath is kindled against you. So the Lord is expressing his divine displeasure against them and tells them the reason for his anger twice, saying, you have not spoken the truth about me. Job's friends have spoken lies about God, about God's justice, and against God's truth. Now this reminds me of what the Apostle Paul's warning against false teachers in the first epistle to Timothy writing, For some men have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. That sounds to me like Job's friends. Now, it is for this reason the Bible tells us that let not many among you be teachers, my brethren, knowing that there is such we will occur a stricter judgment. Teachers will experience a stricter judgment. And now it's time for the stricter judgment against Job's friends. Now, you might be wondering where the fourth friend Elihu is and why God didn't include him in this righteous rebuke. Now some have suggested that Elihu is not included because his words were not as harsh as the others and he's 
was closer to the truth than others. Of course, remember, it took him six chapters to do that. But I don't buy that for a minute. Even though Eli, whose name is not mentioned in the Lord's condemnation, I believe that he is just as guilty as the others. And possibly because of his immaturity, as well as his tendency to have fits of rage, the Lord thought it best just to dismiss him altogether. <laughs> now you can imagine that Job's friends were quite surprised at the Lord's rebuke. They no doubt believed their teachings about the Lord was true. But the, the Lord was angry with them because they had not spoken the truth about the Lord. And as I said in earlier sermons, the biggest problem I have with these guys is that they believed in a work-driven righteousness. Their words made God out to be a divine parole officer, rewarding people for good behavior and imposing punishment for bad behavior. And their words, their words were shrouded with spiritual concepts while being devoid of the gospel of grace. Now, let's just for a moment take the position that Job had committed a trespass against the Lord so great that he deserved the punishment that he got. Now, we know that's not true, but let's just take that position for a second. If, if he had done something so bad as this, as if he had fallen into a trespass like this, then the gospel of grace would have compelled his friends to seek to restore Job in a spirit of gentleness. But instead, they distorted the gospel of grace and they pre preached a rule-driven, rule-keeping righteousness that earns rewards from God. But I also want you to see that the Lord's rebuke consisted of another dimension. In the Lord's rebuke, he contrasts their unfaithfulness to Job's faithfulness, calling Job my servant three times in two verses. Listen, Job wasn't perfect, and everything that Job said during these months of suffering well, wasn't 100% correct. But it seems that Job's words came from a heart that was lamenting towards the Lord. Whereas the words of his friends came from a judgmental heart. Therefore, the one who knows the hearts rebukes Job's friends. So the Lord told them, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. Not deal with you according to your folly. Seems to me like the Lord is already starting to preach the gospel. Because none of us receive the judgment that we deserve for our folly. Their words had been spoken against the Lord, so a sacrifice had to be presented to the Lord. But they were not to be the ones to offer the sacrifice. Job would be the one to offer their burnt, the burnt offering to the Lord. By taking seven bulls and seven rams, Job's friends, they admit their guilt and demonstrate their need for the Lord's forgiveness and for restoration. Remember, the Lord himself appointed the sacrificial system in Genesis chapter 3, when the Lord made garments of skin and clothed Adam and Eve's nakedness, which had been exposed because of their sin. And the sacrificial system that the Lord appointed, well, it pointed to Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen? So all the sacrifices offered in faith pointed to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So Job would act like a high priest 
by receiving these offerings from these repented sinners and offer a burnt offering to the Lord on their behalf and intercede for them. So Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. I just want you to see that as Job, the Lord's servant, offers the sacrifices for his friends, he points to Jesus Christ, who, as God's suffering servant, offered the sacrifice of himself to appease the Father's wrath against sinners. As Job acts as the high priest, he prays for his friends. When he does this, he's pointing to Jesus Christ, who our great high priest makes intercession for all those who draw near to God. Amen? Amen. Once again, we see in the book of Job, is pointing beyond itself. Pointing to the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as an offering for sin and now lives to make intercession for us. Now, there might be those who think that God is humiliating Job's friends by making them go to Job with their sacrifices and ask Job to offer prayers on their behalf. But that would be a false interpretation of what's going on here. God is being gracious and compassionate towards Job's foolish friends who had been caught in a trespass. And instead of ensuing harsh judgment against them, he gives them a visible, a visible representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he allows them to receive the benefits of Christ's redemption. The benefits that neither they nor we deserve. Job prayed and offered sacrifices for those who had grieved and wounded his spirit. And as he does so, he represents Jesus Christ who prayed for his persecutors saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Can't you see it? God is not trying to humiliate Job's friends. God is presenting the gospel of grace to them in a visual form, in a spiritual type. God is not going to live out the lie that these guys have been promoting for months. God is going to live out the gospel of grace and offer them restoration through these types that point to Jesus Christ. For months, these guys have given harsh judgment against Job. But the Lord is not going to act like a fool like they had. He's the God of grace who works wonders amongst us and gives us strength to endure. And he points us to Jesus Christ, the only one that can minister to our souls. And that is exactly what he's doing here in the last chapter of Job. After this great portrayal of God's redemption through Christ, we are told that the Lord restored Job's fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. (laughs) The Lord was good enough to restore Job's wealth to him, even though Job never asked for this. Job's agony was always more rooted in the spiritual aspects of his crisis than the material. But now that the spiritual had been restored, the Lord is going to restore the material. A twofold blessing, twice as before. Now, what is interesting is see how the Lord restores Job's fortune. The text tells us that we see. All of Job's brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. And they comforted and consoled him over all the troubles that the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord used 
the generosity of others to restore Job's fortune. There is no more merciful act than to see someone is hungry and give him something to eat. Or someone who's thirsty and give him something to drink. Or someone who is homeless and give them some place to stay. Or someone who is naked and clothe them. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us, to the extent that you do this to one of these of my brethren, even the least of them, you did it to me. And here what we see in the book of Job is Job's family and his neighbors were showing mercy to the one who had been downtrodden for months. And through the, each one giving just a little bit of their abundance, supplied everything no, needed for Job to get back on his financial feet. Amen. Just a little bit of your abundance. Do you know what it can do? God can take your morsel, your little bit of abundance, and he can turn it into a fortune for others. Now, we saw in the beginning of the book of Job that Job was a, a good businessman. As a matter of fact, his financial success gave him the title as the greatest man in the East. But now, instead of 7,000 sheep, he had 14,000 sheep. Instead of 3,000 camels, he had 6,000 camels. And instead of five a yoke of oxen, Job had 1,000. Instead of 500, he has 1,000 yoke of oxen. Again, we see the twofold blessing being poured out into Job's life. The Lord had taken away, but now the Lord gives back. And the Lord gave him back twice as much as before. Now, we have learned that there are things that Job didn't have the capacity to understand. We have learned that Job did not have the strength to overcome, but Job had discovered the spiritual reality that if you humble yourself before the Almighty God, he will exalt you in a proper time. Amen. And that's exactly what's happening here. Now, verse 13 tells us that Job had seven sons and three daughters, and as we learned in chapter 1, Job had enjoyed a wonderful relationship with his 10 adult children until the day that they were killed in a terrible tornado. The physical loss of his kids was Job's greatest tragedy, and nothing could replace those kids in his mind and in his heart. But here we see that Job's double blessing extended to his family in that the Lord blessed Job with ten additional children. You see, Job knew that his original ten children were with the Lord. And one day, he would be with them again. Job knew that eventually, one day, his entire family, all twenty children, would be together forever. Thanks be to God. The text goes on, nowhere in all the land were found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And the names of Job's daughters are given in verse 14, actually describe their beauty. The first one, turtle dove. The second one, cinnamon. And the third one, horn of beauty. Now, what is interesting is that Job loved these girls so much that he granted them an inheritance with their brothers. If you remember chapter 1, Job would have a birthday party for each one of his seven boys, but there's no reference to the fact where he would host one of these birthday parties for his three daughters. It's really odd. But it seems to me, now Job understands, no, 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 i, I got to include these girls too. He granted them an inheritance along with their, with their brothers. There's nothing like a father's love for his beautiful daughters. And that's the reason why God gave me all boys. Um, <laughs> because he knew that I would be giving away the farm if I had any daughters. 
After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. What a blessing to be a testimony of God's grace for four generations. I can only imagine the stories that Job could tell. The stories about the greatness and the majesty of God in the face of extreme difficulties. I'm sure he was a great counselor to all of those kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and great-great-grandkids. And the book of Job concludes telling us that Job died an old man and full of years. The idea behind this phrase, full of years, means that when Job died, he was satisfied with his life. Satisfied with life. Are you satisfied with life? After 140 years, Job was willing to die being satisfied with his days. What a tremendous blessing it is to go to the grave satisfied with the life that the Lord gave you. Brothers and sisters, it's true. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Throughout this series, I've insisted that Job's spiritual struggle was how to understand how God was getting any glory from his suffering. And even though there are many ways to answer this question, this question be answered, I think the conclusion of the book, these verses that we saw today, really shows us the best answer of how God was getting glory from the suffering of Job. See, Job's contemporaries and four generations that followed him, his sufferings, were given a glimpse of the great Redeemer to come through the life of Job. Let me just summarize that even though Job was rich, he was emptied of all things that were precious to him. He was stricken and suffered greatly. His peers rejected him and cursed him, leaving him to die. But through all this, Job humbled himself and was obedient to the Lord and to his word. Therefore, God highly exalted and bestowed upon him a double portion of the wonderful glory that he had previously enjoyed. Don't you see it? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. As we come to the conclusion of this great drama, it's clear that the book of Job is a drama of redemption. A foreshadowing of the great drama of redemption that will be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus that though he was rich for our sake, he became poor. So that through his poverty, you might become rich. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And it was for this reason that God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the greatest way we can glorify God, even in the midst of difficult times, is to emulate Christ. To emulate Christ. And that's exactly what Job did. Throughout this series, we have linked together Job's declarations of faith. And we see that Job believed in a divine mediator, a divine advocate, a divine intercessor, and a divine redeemer. And it is remarkable that Job uses this term redeemer, saying, I know my redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. It's this redeemer reality that shows the gospel of grace was fully realized and understood in the oldest book of the Bible. 
And of course, because we live in this day of where the revelation of God has been completed, we look at Job's declarations of faith, knowing that he was speaking of Jesus Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man. Brothers and sisters, let us be the people that emulate Jesus Christ, living out this Redeemer reality in this fallen world. Amen. Let's be that people. That even when we go through times of difficulties, we live out a Redeemer reality. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, He will stand as the King on this earth. Let us be a testimony of God's grace and mercy even during difficult times so that the generation that follow us will glorify God that we lived out the gospel of grace to them, for them. Let's pray.